All right, here we are, Proverbs. You know, I haven't taught the book of Proverbs since 1999. Yeah, I was 20 years old. <laughs> Don't laugh so hard. So um, we'll look at this together. I'm going to give you an introduction. I'm going to, first I'm going to read verses 1 through, uh, 1 through 5, actually 1 through 6. I'll read 1 through 6. I'm going to give you an introduction to give you some background and information that is important for the understanding of the book, and then we're going to go into uh, chapter 1. So we're going to look at chapter 1 today. So beginning at uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1, reading to verse 6. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. To give prudence to the simple. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning. And a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. Okay, let's give you an introduction so we have a backdrop. And then we'll move into the verse-by-verse -verse approach to, to the book of Proverbs. So notice how it begins by simply saying the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. So we see that this book was written primarily by Solomon. And Solomon was the son of King David and a woman we all know in Scripture by the name of Bathsheba. Solomon is the main contributor, which is why it's referred to as the Proverbs of Solomon. Now, when you look in the history of Israel, you see that King Solomon reigned from 971 B.C. to 931 B.C. And when you read the Bible, you'll discover that three books are attributed to him. You have the Song of Solomon, the Book of Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. It's been said, though I don't know how scholastic this really is, but it's been said that the Song of Solomon was written when he was a younger man. Because when you read the Song of Solomon, it's a song uh, that's filled with passion. So it's been said that the Song of Solomon was written when he was a younger man, that Proverbs was written when he was in his middle age, and that Ecclesiastes, the third book that he wrote, was written in his older age. Well, no man was better qualified to write this book because he's regarded as the wisest man. You see, remember how that God had spoken to Solomon and said, ask anything of me. As high as the heavens, make your request. And Solomon made his request. He asked for wisdom. And it says in 1 Kings 4, 29 and 30, that God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of of Egypt. In 1 Kings 4.34, it says, And men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now, he was quite a prolific writer. He was a, a man who spoke, according to 1 Kings 4.32, 3,000 proverbs, and he wrote 1,005 songs. Only around 800 of his proverbs are recorded in the book of Proverbs. Now, just to give you some more background, chapters 25 through 29 were assembled during the reign of another king by the name of Hezekiah. Hezekiah ruled from 715 to 686 BC, and uh, they collected it in order that uh, Hezekiah could benefit the people with God's word. There are other contributors that are mentioned. Proverbs 22, 17, all the way to 24, 34, consists of the words of the wise. These are the sages. They had sayings that Solomon may have collected and edited. In chapter 30, uh, chapter 30 is written by an unknown writer by the name of Agur. And chapter 31, we'll see, was by King Lemuel. There's no biblical information on either of these two men. But as you look at Proverbs, the question has to be asked, why would we study it? 
And the reason we study the book of Proverbs is it imparts wisdom. The word wisdom, when you speak of wisdom, speaks very basically of the ability to live life skillfully. So this is one of the few biblical books that declares its own purpose. It's in order to impart wisdom. So Solomon declares in the first chapter that he intends to impart wisdom, instruction, understanding, prudence, knowledge, and discretion to the one who will hear. And so that's what we're going to be looking at as we go through the book of Proverbs. This is a book that is written that's intended to impart wisdom, but the caveat is that you want to hear, that you want wisdom. We're going to look at that in some detail as we go through our introduction in just a moment. But let's begin again in verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. The word proverb is a saying. It's a, a saying of ethical wisdom. It's a lesson that uses comparisons to reveal truth. A, a proverb has a purpose to keep somebody from choosing the wrong course of action. And so a proverb is intended to give proper information so that we can make right choices. And so it's spoken of as the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. And then he goes on in verse 2 to say, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. And then he says, a wise man will hear and increase learning. A man of understanding will attain wise counsel. And so he says, to know wisdom, instruction, and to perceive words of understanding, to receive instruction. Solomon desires us to know. The word know speaks of attaining. He wants us to attain wisdom. And again, he wants us to grow intellectually and experientially. He speaks of wisdom. And again, I mentioned that wisdom is the, the art of skillful living. In verse 2, he speaks of instruction because that's what he wants, to receive for us to, to know wisdom and instruction. In verse 3, to receive instruction of wisdom. The word instruction speaks of mental and spiritual discipline. It's the training of the moral nature which accompanies the gaining of wisdom. It's gaining that which is worth having. Because a lot of people have a lot of information that's not worth having. A lot of us have things in our heads that we don't even need to know anymore. And I still have something, I just, it comes to mind. See, I'm telling you, you're kind of rattling around and I'll say, hey, why don't you tell them this? Stanley, Stanley, Stanley Chevrolet, two blocks off the Santa Ana Freeway. <laughs> 11980 East Firestone, Stanley Chevrolet. Why do I know that? I don't know. But I've known it for 50 or 60 years, and I can't get it out of my head. There's stuff that we know that we don't need to know. That's an example. I could give you more. You don't want any more. But so wisdom and instruction and, and uh, understanding, it, it, this is all something that speaks of value. And he wants to impart to us those things that matter, to teach us to live skillfully, to have a mental and spiritual discipline, to gain discernment, that word understanding in verse 2, to gain discernment by comparing uh, two things and then choosing what is better. That's what he wants us to have. In verse 4, he speaks of prudence. We don't use that word prudence uh, very much, if at all, anymore. It, it, it speaks of that which is circumspect, and what is circumspect speaks of walking with an awareness of your surroundings. Being aware of where you're at is prudence. It's, it speaks of shrewdness, actually. And the word discretion speaks of being on the alert in order to escape evil, in order that you might find good. So I want to give you wisdom, he says. I want to give you instruction. I want you to have understanding. I want you to have prudence, and I want you to have discretion. And that's the reason why he's writing the Proverbs of Solomon. You see, in pursuing the wisdom of the Lord, your life will be skillfully lived, spiritually and mentally disciplined. You will be able to compare things, make the best decisions, and live in such a way that you are pleasing to those you live amongst. Do you want that? I do. And how do you gain that? We'll be studying the book of Proverbs. And that's how you gain it. Notice how he says in verse 5, a wise man will hear and increase learning and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. 
The evidence of a man being wise is revealed by his desire to increase his learning. You see, anybody can have godly wisdom, but they need to diligently apply themselves to the gaining of it. And wisdom is something very often that is gained over a lifetime. We know that God gives wisdom because, as mentioned earlier, God gave wisdom to Solomon. And according to Proverbs 2, verse 6, the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So we know that God gives wisdom. But we also know that it comes in other ways. It comes, for example, by being taught to us. Our parents, as we grew up, and those of influence have given to us the ability to gain wisdom. In Proverbs 4, verse 11, it reads, I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in right paths. So God gives wisdom, and he imparts it very often through teachers who teach us the proper way to live and to gain this wisdom. We're going to see as we study Proverbs how to gain wisdom. We know that wisdom is something that is to be valued. It's something that we're supposed to be pursuing because according to Proverbs 16, verse 16, how much better to get wisdom than gold? Think about that for a minute. How much better to get wisdom than gold and get understanding? To get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. Now, the average person today maybe even amongst believers, would say, I, I haven't paid my bills with wisdom lately. Nice, I, I could use some gold to pay my bills. And wisdom would reply, well, if you had me, you wouldn't be paying that much now, would you? And so, <laughs> how much better to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver? It is to be pursued, Proverbs 2, verse 2. Incline your ear to wisdom. Apply your heart to understanding. Proverbs 4, verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Wisdom is something you prayerfully seek. James 1, verse 15, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, it will be given to him. And wisdom is something that can actually increase with age when the person is living for the Lord. I had spoken to my pastor, Chuck, on one occasion, and I asked him, Pastor, when, do, when does a minister retire out of ministry? And he said to me, when I stop enjoying what I'm doing, it's time for me to get out. As long as I love what I'm doing, he says, I should remain. And then he said this. He said, you know, one of the things about ministry is this. He said, Dave, he said, the longer you live and the longer you walk with the Lord, the more you have to give to somebody else. He says, it's the one thing that you actually gain through life over time. More experience with God, more knowledge of his word, more experience with his, his spirit and all. And so a long life that is lived for the Lord very often is a life that is filled with, with wisdom. In Job 12, verse 12, it says, wisdom is with aged men and with length of days understanding. Uh, wisdom has a fruit that it produces. James 3, 17 says, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Wisdom results from the fear of the Lord. You see then in verse 7 where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And in Job 28, verse 28, it says, To man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. And the New Testament makes it clear, and you'll see this later on as we study through Proverbs, that this wisdom is bound up in Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, verse 3 says, Concerning Jesus, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so Solomon's desire is for us to know the Lord, to understand his ways, to perceive the words of understanding, he says, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. 
He goes on in verse 6 to say, to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. To understand a proverb, proverb and an enigma. In other words, you need to apply yourself to understand mysteries, and perplexing questions. The word enigma is a word that is used that speaks of a mystery. When it speaks of riddles, it talks about difficult or perplexing questions. So to understand a proverb, it means that you apply yourself to understand. Some things take mental discipline. They just don't come naturally. You don't go to bed dumb and wake up wise. We'll just put it that way. You go to bed, and the next morning you wake up and, oh, you're so profound. It doesn't work that way at all. Uh, you act, actually apply yourself. You apply yourself to the gaining of wisdom. We'll see that in chapter 2 next week when we gather, uh, and we see especially in the first six verses how that works. But you apply yourself to the gaining of wisdom. It's like what Paul said as we've been studying through 1 Timothy, how Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, 15 and 16, uh, meditate on these things. Give yourselves entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So there's a pursuit. If you want to grow in your understanding, if you want to grow in wisdom, it's got to be the chief desire of your heart. It's got to be more valuable than gold. It's got to be more valuable than silver. It has to be something that just causes your, you, you to be willing to to um, no longer do some things in order to pursue that which matters. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens over time. It comes through prayer. It comes through seeking the Lord. It, it comes through spending time in the Word of God. It comes through a variety of means, but it's all distributed to you through the Lord and by His Holy Spirit. But He's going to satisfy your, your hungry heart for this if that's what you desire. Where does it begin? Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is the principal part of knowledge, a reverential submission to God. Interestingly enough, this is unique, the fear of the Lord. This is unique in all wisdom literature. You see, for unbelievers, wisdom doesn't begin with God. It does not begin with God. When you read the writings of some of those who are, are, are spoken of as, as profound writers, the Greek thinkers of an earlier day and all, even modern writers that are perceived as being uh, very deep, uh, the overwhelming majority have no fear of God at all. Uh, many of them that are looked at today as being profound are atheists. They have absolutely no foundation of the fear of the Lord at all. So. When, when Solomon begins by saying that all of this actually begins with the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning, he says, of knowledge and wisdom and instruction, that's unique because the other writers through the ages would not have pointed you to the fear of the Lord. But he says that's where it actually begins. You see, an unbeliever doesn't have the fear of the Lord. Psalm 36 verses 1 through 4 says, There is no fear of God before his eyes. For in his own eyes, he flatters himself too much to detect or hate his sin. The words of his mouth are wicked and deceitful. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. Even on his bed, he plots evil. He commits himself to a sinful course and does not reject what is wrong. And that's true. All you need to do is watch the news and watch some of the debates that are going on right now concerning a variety of things. And you're going to see that there are always there's always been sinners and intellectuals who defend the sin. Always. And they will come up with the most interesting things to, to justify evil. And a lot of it, to me, it's, it reminds me of children on playgrounds. You know what I'm saying when I say, one says, you did this, and the other says, ah, uh -uh, you did too. That's kind of how they debate today. You know, you did evil, you did evil, you did worse evil. No, you did, your mama did evil. I mean, that's kind of where it's at today. It's crazy. <laughs> but it's true. So with the Proverbs, it, you'll see this. Listen, wisdom begins in the fear of God. That's where it begins. It is the root of all wisdom to know and understand his ways and to realize the power that he has, his majesty, how awesome he is. And when you have this right sense of reverential awe of God, 
It drives your life to do that which is pleasing to him. But when you don't have that, then you will be driven to do what pleases yourself. That's what you'll do. You will please yourself to the hurt of others. And so Solomon begins, the man who is the wisest man says this is where it begins. It's the principal part of knowledge. And that's something that he never ceased recognizing, even in his darkest days. When you read the book of Ecclesiastes, it's one of those books that you go through 12 chapters, and he tells you all the things that he did. He, he, in his kingdom, when you read concerning the life of King Solomon, in, in his day, gold was like dust. I mean, it was like dirt. I mean, he lived in an opulence. He lived in a, in, in a, a lifestyle that even the richest people who've ever lived have never compared to how Solomon lived. Their, his, his lifestyle was beyond. He had his fill of every desire that man could have. Every entertainment, he experienced it. He even went to the folly of alcohol. He drank. He had as many women as he wanted. He had everything. And you read Ecclesiastes, and he'll tell you. And then he'll, he'll, he'll say what he had done, and then he'll say, and I discovered everything under the sun is vanity. And I did this, and I did that, and I did this, and then I discovered it was vain. And then I did this, and I did And he does that for 12 chapters. And you see this man speaking of all that he did. Read Ecclesiastes. See what I mean? All that he did, all that he had, all the fame that he had. People would travel, you know, the very famous Queen of Sheba. She came to see him. She said, I've heard wonderful things of you, but I didn't hear half of the truth of it. She said, and she blew her mind when she visited him. This is a man that had everything that an individual could want, everything that a man could want. And he said at the end, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. One of the things that's interesting scripture reveals to us is there's no secret thing. God knows it all. He sees it all. Uh, we don't think that sometimes. We think we can hide things from him. We even try to hide our thoughts from him. But he tells us in Psalm 139, he said, I already know your thoughts before they're formed. I already know the words before they're on your tongue. I know it all. You can't hide a thing from me. And uh, Solomon said, no. He said, we need to realize that this is the conclusion of all things. Fear the Lord. So Solomon knew fearing God had benefits, both in this life and in the life to come. And it is revealed in a righteous life, and it adds years of life and a blessing. In Proverbs 19, 23, it says, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. When you have the fear of the Lord, it keeps you from doing an awful lot of things that would end up with you paying a price later on. So he speaks concerning how the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but he says, fools despise wisdom and instruction. Verse 8, my son, hear the instruction of your father. Do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be, graceful, be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. So a practical outworking of the fear of the Lord will be the teaching of God's word to your children. He says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and then he commands in verse 8, hear the instruction of your father. When you give the word of God to your family, if you're a parent here today, when you give the word of God to your children, the word of God produces the moral foundation by which choices will be made in the future. You're giving to them a moral grid. When you pour into your children, when you instruct them in the ways of the Lord, they will have a backdrop by which they're going to be able to judge what is right and what is wrong. That doesn't mean they will always do what is right. 
because if they have their mother's nature, they'll be bad. <laughs> no, if, of course I'm teasing, we received the Adamic nature, came from Adam, but I love to tease that way. No, they're going to do what, what sinners do. But one of the things that I learned over time raising up my children, who are all adults now, but Marie and I learned this. If we poured into them the word of God, when they sinned, as they did, they sinned against the light. They knew right from wrong. They knew right from wrong. I could actually speak to them, and I could say, you know that's wrong. You know that's wrong. And you could get that they could get this little attitude, you know, this little stiff back thing that they do. And I just would stay there. I'd just say, no, you know it's wrong. Yeah, it's wrong. Yeah, it's wrong. There were times when we were talking as a father to a child, and I, they would want to argue. And I would say, I think you've made a mistake. What do you mean? I think you think we're having a conversation. We're not. I'm telling you. And it comes from this direction. This is what I'm telling you. We're not conversing this. It's not your opinion versus mine and one of them's right, one of them's wrong. You're wrong. And the reason you're wrong is because this is what God's word says. And this is how we line up. See, so that's how I would speak to my children from the time they were old enough to want to argue. When they're younger, they would just kind of smile. When they got older, they thought they had brains. <laughs> and they did. But they also needed their thoughts to be brought in line with God's word. And that's what he's saying. Hear the instruction of your father. Do not forsake the law of your mother. The instruction, law, we have imparted to you. Hold fast to these things. These are the things that are creating within you that foundation because choices will be built on the foundation of your early days. And again, that's the single responsibility of the child to the family, by the way. When you read scripture, obedience is that one requirement to the family. See, God's word is simple to the children. And the fact is the Bible teaches them to obey and to honor God. In, in Exodus 20, verse 12, it reads, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. Ephesians repeats that in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. So the Bible teaches us as parents to raise our children, and their responsibility is to obey the father and mother as they give the word of God. And the result, verse 9, they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. In other words, obedience to the parents results in children developing an attractive life. It speaks of graceful ornaments. When it speaks of these graceful ornaments, those are beautiful, charming qualities, qualities that develop. It's a result of practicing what they're being taught. He says, this is what it's going to be like. It'll be a beautiful character. Then he goes on to warn, verse 10, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us lurk, lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol and whole, like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. For their feet run to evil, they make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. But they, wait, they lie in wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. And so if sinners entice you, do not consent. Even if they say, come with us. What is this? This is an exhortation. And notice it begins in the first chapter. It's an exhortation to stay away from bad company. Interestingly enough, if you look at this, and I want you to see this, you may think I'm teasing you, and I'm really not. 
Notice what it says in verse 10 and 11. If sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. It goes on. You, you know what you're saying here? You, 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 this, stay away from gangs. Isn't that interesting? That's what he's saying. Stay away from gangs. That's what was just described here. You may not even notice it as I was reading it to you. But that's what he's saying. Son, stay away from bad guys. Stay away from bad company. And in this way, he's describing the gang style, the gang lifestyle of his day. Isn't that interesting? But that's what he's describing right now. He says, he says if, if gangsters are persuading you, if they allure or seduce you to join their gang, don't do it. In verses 11 and 12, you notice it says they lie in wait to ambush. They're waiting to, to assault, to seduce, maybe even to kill. And they boast that they're so tough that they can take even the most powerful person as surely and as swiftly as death swallows its victims. It, it gives promises in verse 13 and 14 uh, that they're saying we'll find all kinds of precious possessions. We're going to fill our houses with all of this stuff. In other words, after robbing people, our houses are going to be filled with their possessions. And then they entice in verse 14, and they say, cast in your lot among us. We'll have one purse. In other words, we're going to have easy and quick wealth, and we're going to give to you a share of whatever it is we get. So they're enticing you. And what is his command? Verse 15, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. Don't do it. Stay away from them. Don't get involved with them. Why? Verse 16, for their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood. They live for evil. They hurry to perform it. And they're willing to injure the innocent to get what they want. I'm watching the news just yesterday. Some guy is running away from the police. Perhaps you saw it on the news. S drives into a, an underground parking structure, smashes into a car, gets up, tries to run. The, the, they'll, they'll injure innocent people. You know, a, a mother and a child will be driving, and, and somebody's trying to evade the police after robbing somebody, smashes into the car, kills the child. They, they, they don't think, and that's what Solomon's saying. They're going to do anything they can to get away, and they're going to do anything they can to the innocent if it gets them what they want. So he's saying, son, don't do it. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. In verse 17, surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Um, even birds are wiser than these evil people. A, a bird will avoid a trap, but they don't. At least be as wise as a bird that avoids a trap that ultimately ends up killing them. So he's saying, you know, a bird knows to stay away from that which is dangerous, son. You ought to know the same. He goes on and he says in verse 18, but they lie in wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who's greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. So the blind folly of greedy people results in their own destruction. It takes away the life of its owners. In other words, they're not going to get away with it. Sometimes it appears that they are, but they don't. You don't get away with it. You end up paying the price, he says, and they're going to, it's going to, they will reap what they have been sowing. He goes on in verse 20, wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open square. She cries out in the chief concourses at the openings of the gates in the city. She speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, Will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you, because I've called you. I've called, and you have refused. I have stretched out my hand. No one regarded, because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes, when your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come.
come upon you. That's pretty heavy. Wisdom, verse 20, calls aloud outside and raises her voice. Wisdom is pictured as standing in an open square, and she's crying to anybody who will take a moment just to listen to her. But no one stops to listen, and no one cares. It's like sometimes, and we could discuss this, I guess, at length, really, but it's like sometimes when, when people are standing on street corners doing street preaching, and the people just either they just ignore them or they mock them. They're not interested. Even when that preacher is giving a solid warning and a solid cry for people, people just walk by and ignore them. Well, that's the picture of wisdom. Wisdom standing in, in like a mall or a plaza at, at a thoroughfare, a place where a lot of people are gathering. And he's picturing wisdom standing there crying out to people and, and saying, come and, and receive from me. But notice, no one stops to listen. Why? Because nobody really, really cares. And it says in verse 22, how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning. Fools hate knowledge. And that you can almost hear a tear in the voice there. He speaks concerning the, the, the simple. The word simple there speaks of people who are naive. Uh, these are those who are satisfied with life as it is. They really don't need much more than food and drink, a place to live, something to watch on TV. They, they have no desire for anything deeper than that. So he refers to them as the simple ones in verse 22. In verse 22, he speaks of the scorners. The scorners are interesting. You've got like two categories. On the one, you've got the person who's happy watching the game, drinking a beer, and that's as far as he wants to go. That's, that's life for him. But then you have the scorners. The scorners are the cynical. They're the defiant ones. They have no shame. They have no conscience. They have no decency. They actually take an act of delight in scorning other people's beliefs. Religion is stupid and for the weak. And scorn Bill Maher is your name. Because there are guys like him who have their programs, and that's all they do is they, they make movies or religious and things like that to mock people of faith. That is a scorner, a person who looks at you and looks at me, and there are many who see us believers as real, just very simple-minded, very naive, very unsophisticated, uh, uneducated, just foolish people. You know, we cling to our God and our guns and our religion. They're scorning us. And that's what they do. And there are many people who do that. And, we, and you have friends and you have relatives who do that. You have people that you go to work with. You have people that, if you're in school, who are in school. You're professors. Many of them are scorners. When I was in college, you know, for, for a number of years, I had a number of, of professors who made it their, their, um, their chore. It was their, it's like their mission to undermine your faith. They, they would say things. I, I, I had one professor in particular that comes to mind who the very first day of class said to, how, said to us, how many of you are Christians? How many of you are born again? And I was in a sociology class in Cal Poly. And, and how many of you are uh, believers in uh, uh, Christians, born againers? So a handful of us raised our hand out of about 25 or 30 students. There may have been three or four of us who raised our hand. And the first thing he said in the very first day of class is, I feel sorry for you. That was the first thing. That was the opening introduction. That was our opening lecture. I feel sorry for you, is what he told us. Because you believe the words of that little black book, speaking of the Bible. You believe those words, and I feel sorry for you. He says, I'm a scientist, and I believe in facts, and I believe in verifiable scientific evidence. And you don't. You walk around just believing, but I have to believe in facts. Interestingly enough, this man who believed in facts in one of the... Uh, lectures he gave to us, told us how people say that there is a correlation between smoking cigarettes and lung cancer. He said, I've got a lot of studies that prove that that's not true. He says, I smoke, and I've been smoking for years. He says, and I've got a lot of studies, scientific studies, that demonstrate that that is not true, that's fallacious. 
He died of lung cancer. That's the truth. He died of lung cancer. The man who pitied me, the man who pitied my beliefs, the man who trusted in his science, not that science is bad, I'm, I'm not saying that it is, but this man had placed faith in a position that he thought it was unreasonable and just purely stupid and naive. Well, that man who pitied me, I pitied him. He died, a lonely man, couldn't keep his marriages together, went through three women, couldn't, couldn't keep his life together. Professor, well-educated, PhD, and he considered us, those of us who believe the word of God and trust in him, who have hope for eternity, have a joy that comes through our relationship with him, who's blessed our lives. He pitied us but that's called a scorner. They're defiant. They're cynical. They have no shame. They have no conscience. They have no decency. They take active delight in scorning belief. For them, religion is stupid. It's only for the weak. And then you have the fools. The word fool speaks of a morally insensitive individual. Anything that makes them think or uncomfortable is to be avoided at all costs, especially anything that convicts them. They don't want to hear it. They want nothing to do with it. They are people who try to not be made uncomfortable at any cost. And, and a lot of us have people, it's Christmas season, and uh, every one of us has a relative or two that uh, is exactly like that. Don't say anything to me about God, please. I mean, let's just celebrate the real reason for Christmas, which is drinking and eating, you know, and giving presents and trying to feel good one day out of the week. And they have their own philosophy per per pertaining to that, but they're very insensitive morally. So he's speaking about that here. And what does he say in verse 23? He says, turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Turn, turn at my rebuke. Wisdom speaking, but it also can be a picture of God who is wisdom. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28, in the Old Testament, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. In John 7, 38 and 39, Jesus said, He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So as wisdom is speaking, wisdom is saying, I will pour my spirit on you. And he also, wisdom also says, I will make my words known to you. Well, in John 14, 26, Jesus said, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Listen, when you turn to the Lord and you say, God, I, I want your wisdom and I want to understand your ways, he says, I'll, I'll make myself known to you. Guys, understand that today. Understand that you haven't been left in the dark. You haven't been left alone. You haven't been left without wisdom. You haven't been left without understanding. God says, I will give it to you. But you do pursue him. You wake up in the morning and you say, today is the day the Lord has made. I will be glad. I'll rejoice in it. Lord, I'm going to pursue you. I will seek you with all my heart today. I'm going to pursue you. I'm a believer. I'm going to follow you today, Lord. You're going to give me a lot of opportunities today to be a witness for you, and there are going to be a lot of opportunities to stumble. God, I need your help, and I want to start out right with you today. And even as it says, turn up my rebuke, I will pour my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. And so you say, Lord, I'm going to read your word. I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to serve you today. You have promised that you would do this for me, and I know you will. In verse 24, I have called, you refused. I have stretched out my hand, no one regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes, when your terror comes like a storm, your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. I have called, I have stretched out my hand, you refused, you didn't regard, you disdained, you rejected counsel, you would not receive correction. Therefore, because you refused all of this, I will leave you to reap the consequences. You see, when things are going well for you, you mocked me. 
When things were going good, you rejected my counsel. You didn't need me. You had no time for me. You had no desire for me. You didn't need me. That's, that's the interesting thing. Have you guys ever noticed how, how, how even we as a nation, we begin to turn our back slowly but surely on God. And then a storm hits or a fire hits. And people begin to cry out. And they say, where is God? Where is God? Where is your God? Well, wait a minute. You kicked him out a long time ago. You did. You, you said, we don't want you in the classroom. You said, we don't want teachers praying. Speaking of Jesus Christ, you, you said, we don't want to say even the most simple, inane thing like Merry Christmas. It's got to be happy holidays because we don't want to offend people. You've been kicking God out for years. And then you have a problem, and you say, where is God? You tell me where he is, because you're the one who told him to leave. That's a fact. And the Lord here, look what he's saying. I called, you refused, I stretched out my hand, no one regarded. You disdained my counsel. You would have none of my rebuke. So you're reaping what you're sowing. I'll laugh at your calamity. I'll mock when your terror comes, when your terror comes like storm. Your destruction comes like a whirlwind when distress and anguish come upon you. You're going to call, but I won't answer. You're going to have trouble, but no resource to deal with them. And the tragedy will leave you devastated because you were not prepared to deal with it. He says in verse 28, they will call on me. I will not answer. They will seek me diligently. They will not find me because they hated knowledge, did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel, despised my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way, be filled to the full with their own fancies. For the turning away of the simple will slay them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Isn't that cheery? You refuse God. You refuse my word. You refuse to seek me. You refuse to communicate through prayer. And then your terror hits you, and you wonder where I am. But you refuse to seek me. You didn't search for me. And now you will have no help. You've come to me too late. In John 7, 33 and 34, Jesus said the, this to some who were questioning him. Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. You, when I was present with you, you had every availability to have relationship with me, but you never availed yourself of that. And the day's going to come when there is no relationship between you and me. It, it, that's why it's, it's important for us to rise up early and seek him. That's why it's important for us as believers to actually understand what it means to be a believer, to be serious. You know, I, I'm, I'm believing that we're in a time right now where um, it, it's easier for us to be known for what we believe now. Um, it has been said, and I think right, rightly so, that the 50s, in the 50s, somebody once said, and there's some truth to this, in the 50s, more people went to hell than pretty much any time in the United States. And I thought that was very interesting. But the point they were making was the United States in the 50s, here in, you know, in some people's history and some people's memories even, in the 50s in the United States, coming after World War II and and being on top of the world with this, what was called the greatest generation, there, were, there was a lot of morality in the United States. The United States at one time, as a, as a nation, was, was really regarded as, as the city on a hill. It really was. The United States at one time was regarded very highly because of its moral strength. We, we were, as a nation, a very, a very moral nation. There were, there were, there were 
strong requirements for citizenship. There were, there were laws on the book, uh, books that were enforced, such as uh, uh, ordinances against uh, public profanity. Uh, what is common in language today when you're in a store and somebody's wearing a t-shirt with some expletive on it, or you hear a mom speaking swear words to her kid, some of you have heard that I have, swearing at them like, I mean, horribly, you know, and that, that you could be fined. You could get a ticket for using language that was improper. Um, there were so many things I grew up in that today's world is so different than even when I grew up. It's, it's difficult sometimes for me to adjust because things are accepted today that were never accepted before. The parades and, and the programs on TV, um, it, it's, it's profane. I mean, and, 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 and I'm not trying to sound like an old fuddy-duddy, but I am explaining. That word shows you I'm a fuddy-duddy, but <laughs> an old goat. Um, but y y some of you don't know this. Y you know, do you know that they didn't even have toilets that were seen in... In, in sitcoms in the 60s and 70s, you did that one of the, fir the first time a toilet was ever flushed on TV was on Archie Bunker, uh, All in the Family, and that they called groundbreaking because nobody even, you never acknowledged you even had a toilet in your house. It was always amazing to me that Lucy and Ricky had a kid because they slept in two different beds. You know, there was no swearing, there was no, there was no profanity, there was nothing like that at all. And what has happened to the younger generation is the younger generation that's coming up now that we have such a burden for, the younger generation does not have a moral code that they live by. I don't know what that is. What is that? Are we on fire? I'll see you later. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Oh, that's an Amber Alert. Okay. <laughs> All the iPhones are going off. Oh, I get it. We didn't have iPhones. <laughs> Instant communication. Isn't that interesting? See, so we live in a different time. My illustration, perfect. In a different time. Telephones used to be used to talk on. So we, 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 as a society, have become hardened. And so you'll have people who argue and say, keep your religion to yourself. And then a hurricane hits. And then a fire hits. Then a flood hits. And the church responds. The church sends teams. The church cleans out people's houses. The church prays with a hurt woman, cares for her children. The church does that. Church always has done that. But see, the world will say, we don't need you, God. We can do it ourselves, God. But God says, I'm going to leave you to yourself. And that's what he's saying. You would have none of my counsel. You despise my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with full of their own fancy. For the turning a way of the simple will slay them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. Because you follow the way of wisdom, you will not enter into the path of an evil life. And the result of avoiding evil is that you will have peace. In Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. If I can give you anything as a closing thought about this, I can tell you this. I've been walking with the Lord for a long time now, and I can tell you what, he just, what I just read out of Isaiah 26, God keeps you in perfect peace. You know why? Because my God does not fail. My God does not fail. My God does not fail. God has always been right on time. God has always done what he promised. He always has. He always has. And I, I can tell you that. I've been walking with the Lord this month 47 years. 47 years. 
And I can tell you, my God has always been on time. Now, when I was young, I wondered if he was going to show up. I did. Are you, 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 can, can you not hear me groaning? Uh, can you not see what I'm going through? God, you see my tears. You hear my cry. I've been there, done that. We all do. And then the Lord says, I'm always on time. Not a second too soon and not a second too late. I am always right on time. He always is. So I've learned to wait patiently on the Lord because he will arrive at the right moment. And my heart can be in peace. And I am telling you, I have been the person who has struggled wondering God. And I've gotten to the place now in my walk with the Lord where I say, you know what? My God is good. My, my God will show up. My God does take care of me. My God has never forsaken me. My God will never leave me. My God loves me. My God is here because he promised he will keep his word. I will trust him. And that's what the Lord is simply saying. They had nothing to do with me. They don't have me. But if you follow me, I'll be with you. I will be with you. Wisdom. We're going to have a good time going through Proverbs. Amen.